What's up everybody? Um, as promised, I'm going to put together a couple videos really quick about what different roles um, I've had over the past couple of years um, since getting out of school and starting in engineering. Um, I'm just going to split them up into different videos, but I'll probably shoot a couple of them right now and um, put them out as soon as I can, probably end of this week I'll have them all up. So. As I had mentioned in the video just prior to this, I have worked uh, in three roles uh, for the company that I work for currently. Um, I've worked as a tuning, uh, gas turbine tuning engineer, as an engineering assessment engineer as well, like service engineering assessment engineer, and then also as a manufacturing engineer. So what I'll do is I'll start really quick with the um, most current position that I have and then I'll go into the other two afterwards. So for the manufacturing engineer, as I had mentioned before, I work um, in the industrial gas turbine industry and uh, our company provides um, services for industrial gas turbines, so gas turbines at power plants. Um, and we also provide replacement components, which include uh, replacement in kind and some upgrade components to um, IGTs. So, as a manufacturing engineer, the, the obvious focus is on producing uh, parts and the requirement of creating all of the technical documentation and guidance behind producing those parts. So the way that they have structured my position in our company and, and what you'll see is that although there are a lot of similarities, um, there will be differences and nuances between each company that you work for and the roles even within a company, within a group, you'll have variation um, even within the same group in the same company, but um, generally a lot of the, a lot of the high-level roles will transfer over to different uh, positions. So, in my role, um, they have uh, titled us as hardware owners over the entire life cycle of the part. Um, and the life cycle of a part essentially means that you own it from the first time it is produced, so what's called new make production, um, and also you are involved in reconditioning the part. So for our industry, um, the majority of parts are reconditionable, um, or you know you could call it refurbished. So because the, the initial cost of the parts are so high, um, and because a lot of the um, distress of the parts can be corrected, you know, via different processes for a, s a smaller price than buying a new um, set of components, there is a market for reconditioning them. So for aero engines, I believe that that market is very different and smaller it, it's it's just a different animal, so I wouldn't say it's smaller, um, but I would say it, it's it's different. In IGT, there's um, reconditioning of all turbine parts, um, where you'll take an engine part, engine run part, and strip it down to its base material, and you'll start routing out uh, distress items and welding them, and heat treating and coating. Um, till you get to a part that's as close to a new part as you can and you'll sell that part. So anyways, um, without veering off too much, uh, let me go back to high level what, what's included in my roles today. So again, we're responsible for the whole life cycle of the part. Um, that interaction begins um, ideally when the part is being first designed and when you have your design engineers put together all of the CAD and the analysis needed based on the 
design parameters that they're given at the onset of the project. Um, you'll go in as a manufacturing engineer, you'll start uh, to get involved on the latter, I'd say, third um, of the design process. So that's when they're taking the um, they're taking their designs and they're starting to either run the first trial production parts or they're starting to discuss with the supplier, with you involved, um, what the necessary fixturing would look like for those parts. Um, and in, in ideal cases, you'll be in the review meetings. So you'll be part of the review team and part of the review meetings to, um, to review the different stages of production. So for our parts, and for many uh, of the parts in aero and in uh, industrial gas turbines, you have casting, machining, and coating, um, and then sub-component uh, assembly uh, being performed. So you will review the drawings and specifications for, for your components for each of those stages, hopefully along with the design team as you go through it. Um, that's your first involvement with the part. Then, as you as you continue on further um, through the uh, production of the part, you're gonna uh, see that um, you're gonna be more involved in fixing the production-related issues with a given supplier. So. Um, in a lot of cases, you you work with a third uh, party vendor, where you're giving them the te technical requirements. Oh, you know, in unison working with the design engineers, especially on newer pr products, and you're trying to meet the gap between uh, what was designed and what is manufacturable. What is um, what are the realities of the process capabilities for each of those um, process phases, you know, casting, machining, coating, and assembly, and along that those lines are heat treats. Um, so, for new make suppliers, you you may your involvement will be transferring some of the some of the technical documentation to them, you know, so drawings and specifications. Um, you'll work through uh, how how they're inspecting products, um, and you'll try to, uh, to to the best of your ability, work with them to identify what are the most important items to be inspected and how ideally they should be inspected. Um, and then you work through uh, the non-conformances that are identified. So the reality is that nothing is ever perfect. And um, although you strive to improve the process, there's always um, things that are not manufactured perfectly. And so part of your responsibility as a manufacturing engineer in most cases is to review um, the non-conformances identified um, during production. And when you review them, you go through a series of efforts to correct them. So on one hand, you have to review whether or not the part is acceptable as it is or if it needs to be reworked so let's say that they um, they cut they cut a hole incorrectly so you can review whether or not um, the part can stay as as it is with incorrect let's say hole position or hole diameter or whether or not you need to go in and rework it um, so you'll either have a good grasp of it of yourself or you'll have to reach um, to the rest of the team for support to determine whether or not the nonconformance is is, um, is you know the, the the level of urgency uh, of the component does it affect you know they they like to say the three Fs form fit and function um, but really you know will the part you still fit will it still you know meet expectations of performance and durability. Um, so that's uh, you know working through NCRs with the suppliers, and you're working also with the quality team to to kind of 
document all of those reworks. So it is a lot of uh, documentation that you have to do. It's a lot of tracking that has to be done um, because you know everything is by serial uh, number basis and depending on the system you're using to track NCRs, it can be a little bit cumbersome to um, to identify what's actually wrong, determine what your recommendation is, relay that in recommendation, get it approved, and then track what the following rework yielded. So that's a whole other animal, you know, and, and that's, that's part of the tasks. You also get into the subject of corrective action. So like when you, uh, when you run through a corrective action, you're going to uh, end up having to identify what was the root cause of the nonconformance. And um, working with the supplier, you're going to have to identify what corrective path you're going to take. Um, there are other things, but to move on, uh, that's, that's all more so related with new make production. We're also uh, working on reconditioning. So as I had mentioned, that's taking a used or engine run part and trying to recondition it to as close as possible to new make specifications. And with that, we are working with a team of engineers to outline all of the technical operations and steps and work instructions to do that. So you will have to work again with a team of engineers. So I keep mentioning a team of engineers. Generally, I'll tell you who that can be. So you, of course, have your design engineer. So design engineers, again, they're given a certain parameter set um, a design envelope and they will work with you know CAD, geometry, um, aero to to create the initial design and usually they're the ones that have probably the, the most um, thorough uh, technical knowledge of the parts um, and they're very good sources of information and then from the manufacturing side of it, you'll have different process engineers. So as I mentioned, there are different processes that are used to make everything. And uh, depending on the process, usually you'll have in a, in a medium to larger company, you'll have ind individual process engineers in charge of, let's say, heat treating, coating, um, welding and jo you know, joining, uh, welding and braze, and then uh, machining, uh, casting, so at least that's the way that our company is set up. So you'll work w with a team of engineers to identify you know, solutions for different problems for each of those processes. Um, in reconditioning, uh, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, my current, task, my current tasks, we have process engineer, sorry, we have production engineers who are responsible for following the parts through the shop that already have all of their technical documents and guidelines identified. And for those sets of hardware, my involvement should be minimal um, and I only have to review the nonconformances if and when they occur. But really the for reconditioning, once you create all the paperwork and documents showing or outlining the process, it is handed over to someone else to, to kind of follow through with each individual piece of hardware going through the shop. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll say a couple more things. Um, with Relative to the daily work activities, what is it that, what are some other things that we see? I just described like high level what we do, um, but from a day-to-day -day standpoint, you will be um, reviewing nonconformist documents. You will be um, discussing with all the different process engineers what are the recommended uh, corrective actions or the rework scopes. Um, you'll be talking with suppliers all the time with regard to your parts and the status of their parts and what problems they're facing, what you can do to help with them. And then in my case, our company, we thankfully have a workshop that is um, adjacent to our offices so um, we run production in our shop uh, and so a lot of my work is 
also walking out physically to go look at the hardware that's affected. Um, and that's probably what I like most about my job right now is that a good, it varies, but I'd say a good 50, 45 to 50 percent of my work forces me to go out to the shop and look at physical hardware, look at cracks in material, look at um, different distress modes, oxidation of base material, um, spallation of uh, thermal barrier coating or um, TBC, and um, giving recommendations, taking photos, taking, taking measurements of parts, and um, the, that also includes giving direction to people. So how do you give direction to people? Um, there, I'm sure there's a, there are many different systems used in the industry for different companies, but for us it's a really simple um, process. We 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 um, we'll identify the rework and then we relay that rework via routings, which are like binders that have all the operations necessary to be performed in the shop. Shop, and um, we give as many as much detail as we can to as to how to correct the part and we hand that over to um, the operators and they perform the rework because as an engineer in many cases especially in a mid-sized to large company you're not going to be physically reworking the parts yourself like you're not taking you're not dropping the part on a mill and let's say milling a part uh, although that would be awesome but most of the time um, Basically, you need to be certified in the use of those machines, and you're working on very expensive hardware that um, have tolerances of one thousandths of an inch, so 0 .001, thousand, uh, 0 0.001 of an inch, um, and uh, it's critical that they're correct. A lot of times, once they're incorrect, it's very hard to rework, so the reality is that there are specialists that, that are trained and familiar with doing that. So as an engineer, it's not really your role. Um, although I'd say that in some of the smaller companies, I know that um, if you've got you know five or six engineers and, and you're working you know, 40, 50 parts, and you've got only two operators, I've definitely heard of engineers getting out into the shop and being a lot more hands-on now, the catch is that when you go into a smaller company like that, you may be more hands-on physically, but when it's all said and done, there's only a certain amount of hours in a day and there's only a certain amount of workload capacity that you have. So you may, it, it's like you've, you may do more work in the shop and less, let's say, technical work. So you won't be on CAD, you won't be looking at drawings as much or you know, in terms of making drawings at least. Uh, and on the other hand, you may be reviewing the drawings and understanding how to physically make them. And that's, that's really, I think, a different um, example that is not the case in our company because uh, we're like a mid, uh, mid-size, 500 plus person company. So, um, Yeah, that's that's probably all that I'll say right now. Something that I didn't mention is travel. So what can you expect as for travel? I think this varies a lot company to company, but the reality is as a manufacturing engineer, you're going to likely need to travel um, for work. So it's I'll talk in a separate video about tuning and service engineering and hardware assessment, but um, for a manufacturing engineer, engineering uh, you need to review and you know quasi audit or you know I guess you'd, you'd audit vendors and so although you may in your company have quality engineers who audit vendors on their own um, what I've seen is that whenever you run into a problem at a vendor um, the question always comes up whether or not someone is going to fly out and visit the vendor so I like doing that. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. You always learn something new when you go into a new shop. But uh, I guess you'd say it depends, but you could be anywhere from 20 to 30% of your time traveling. Um, and it sometimes is more travel some of the months, some of the years of the month. I'm sorry, some of the months of the year. Um, 
when maybe you're coming up to an important deadline and you're having problems at a supplier. I know that de it depends on the company. Our company, we do a lot of the final work in-house. So when you run into those issues, a lot of the times it's it's just outside. It's like 10 feet from your desk. There's a workshop and you go and you work, work it out with that shop. But if your company is one that has all of their work outsourced and you're not next to a workshop and you're just in a cubicle uh, office or in an office building, you know, 700 miles away from where the parts are being made, in those cases, those manufacturing engineers have to travel more. I would say it's like 30 to 40 percent is what I've heard, um, but I, that is something that generally is discussed when you, you know, let's say interview with that company. That's something that has to be brought up and, and will pr likely be brought up up front because usually a standard is about 20 percent uh, travel and uh, anything more than that there's probably going to be some compensation based off of like overtime or travel expenses things just things like that anyhow um, that's all that I can think of at the moment with regard to manufacturing engineering it's, it's really high level but um, what I plan on doing is first of all going and creating separate videos about my other couple of jobs that I've had um, now something to keep in mind I say that I've had different jobs it's mostly been for the same management but based on the fact that our company is still a little bit small and that sometimes the needs change quickly because of that and also because I'm open to I'm open to change um, I've had a couple roles in the same company um, so I'll do a couple videos specifically on those other tasks but for for manufacturing engineering you know I've spoken for about 20 minutes now and I think that that's a pretty good summary of what you can expect I'm also going to create shorter videos talking about just specific subjects in the work environment for engineering that probably applies across all the different disciplines and, um, and you know, you, you'll see those coming out as soon as uh, I can get them out. So thanks very much.